everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar entitled Ukraine and the China-Russia Access with uh, Tom Miller. And um, those of you who've been on there for the last uh, couple of minutes will, will heard us think, talking about, we had Tom on a number of years ago when he had brought out China's, China's Asia Dream Book, which um, he very kindly informed me that there's now a second edition with uh, a different conclusion or an updated conclusion and introduction. And in fact, uh, Tom would have been, I think it was a call, but it was one of our first calls. So it's great to have you back, Tom. Um, Thank you for having me again. And uh, so China's Asia Dream was all about, um, all about the Belt and Roads Initiative. And I had as a placeholder there, just as you came on, give people an idea of where all the stands are, the scale of the area. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to ask Tom a number of, a series of questions. He sort of says interview, but I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. I, I'm not sure whether I'm David Dimbleby or who. Um, and then we'll throw it open for questions. But to, just to remind you, write the questions in at any stage on the Q&A button. You're all very familiar with that by the, at this stage. Um, and I, I put the questions to Tom either at the end or where relevant uh, in the context. OK, so we'll quick off. And Tom, thank you again for uh, doing this. Um, there's a famous piece of research okay, go back by McKinder, The Geographical Pivot of History, which is an ancient piece, 1904. Not that easy to read. And then there was another piece by Brezhnevsky. I think I'm saying it right, who was Carter's... Uh, Chief of Staff, the Grand Chessboard, written in 1997, both of them referring to the great Eurasia continent. So my, 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 my first question is, is it kind of, so why is the region important? And, and, and why were those two historical, one very historical and one more 20 odd years ago, what were they getting at in terms of the importance of this region? Right, well, I've got to really stretch my brain back now because it's been a long time since um, I've looked at this stuff. But um, Mackinder um, came out with this theory called the kind of heartland theory, where he saw Eurasia as really being the most sort of, the, the, the sort of vital strategic region um, in the world. Um, and it wasn't that clearly defined. And it sort of goes beyond what I've been writing about recently, which is um, sort of Central Asia, which are, which are the sort of five um, stands um, that gained independence after the um, dissolution of the Soviet Union. But he was also writing about um, the Caucasus um, as well. And I think um, the idea was that wh whoever um, whoever controlled um, the um, the grand heartland in, in Eurasia would essentially um, kind of control the world, um, if you like. It's, it's a big kind of complex theory and rather out of date. And I'm not really sure um, how relevant it is today, but you know, it, uh, it does sort of sit at the heart of some of the thinking about why Central Asia remains very, very important. Because you know, if, if you look at it ostensibly, you know, this is a big kind of empty space. Um, not many people live there. So you kind of think, well, why do we care about this? Um, but I think we care about it for um, a number of re reasons. And that comes back to Brzezinski um, as well. Um, and um, one of them simply is that it's, it's also uh, um, at the heart of the closer relationship now between um, Russia um, and China. And um, a lot of this um, is about energy um, and, um, and energy links. Um, but it's also about um, security. Um, and you've got to think about Afghanistan, um, you know, where um, not just um, uh, the US and its NATO allies, but also, of course, Russia in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and, and of course, the Brits actually going back um, into Victorian times. You know, a lot of people spent a lot of time there and lost a lot of lives and, 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 and a lot of money. It's, it's a region um, that, however sort of empty and far away it seems, um, it does seem to... Um, always be a sort of regular strategic or security issue um, and uh, it's something that that we cannot ignore. Okay okay so within that so Putin um, and obviously the point of the, the timing of, of the, the chat today is what's obviously going on in, in, in Ukraine and, and while you won't necessarily be a, a Ukrainian expert or whether everybody knows what exactly is going to happen there. I think the context is, is interesting because Putin has his Eurasian Economic Union. Mm. I think he obviously wants people to join. And then we have what I think was the Shanghai Five, which is the Shanghai 
cooperative organization. So will you talk to us a little bit about those organizations? And I think there's another organization, which is more of a security organization, which was called in during the Kazakhstan. Uh, yeah, the CSTO, yes. Okay, so what's the role of all of those and um, where do they fit into the current current situation? Right. Okay, so this is all a little bit complex and they're all a little bit overlapping, um, but let's go through them in order. Okay, so um, the oldest out of them is the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Um, and this is um, essentially um, a group of, sort of Russia and ex-Soviet states who work together, um, it's a military alliance, and they work together on security interests. Um, and, um, and so when Kazakhstan um, had its recent up uprising and there was chaos um, in, the, in the streets, um, and um, the, the president of Kazakhstan went to the CSTO to ask for them to come in and restore order, okay? Because it's fundamentally a military alliance um, and um, it maintains sort of troops in Central Asia. Um, most of them are Russian. Uh, Russia being obviously by far the biggest presence um, in it. At the same time, you also then have the SCO, which is the Shanghai um, um, Co, um, co, co uh, excuse me, Co, co -op Operation um, Organization. I have a little bit of a stammer, so I get stuck on certain, on certain consonants. Oh, um, all of what's going on there. Yeah. Um, and um, so, so this was founded, as you say, as the Shanghai Five in the late 1990s. Um, and this was um, when China was beginning to get interested um, in. Um, in Central Asia. So it was just beginning to buy energy. So, you know, for example, from countries like Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan um, and beginning to look beyond its borders. So this is when, you know, China was beginning to develop, but it was still kind of early days and they were just putting out sort of feelers um, around the world. You know, they were beginning to just play a little bit of a sort of international role. And the SCO was the start of that. So that was China, Russia, um, and three countries um, in Central Asia. But since then, that it's expanded um, and um, it now includes all five um, Central Asian states. Um, it also includes um, uh, India and Pakistan. Um, and Iran is also coming on board as well. Now, um, it's sort of a mixture of a security, it's not quite an alliance, a sort of security grouping, but it also has um, economic aspects as well. Um, and as you might tell from the name Shanghai, you know, it's, uh, it's led from, from China. So China's the leading presence as opposed to the CSTO where Russia um, is the leading presence. Um, but uh, so far, it hasn't done very much more than hold lots of meetings and bring countries together who otherwise wouldn't talk. Now, that is, is pretty useful in its own right. Um, but it, it, if you want to sort of point at, um, at sort of concrete um, sort of results, um, they're few and far between, I would say, at the moment. But it, it is, you know, it is growing in importance. And um, post the um, US withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think it will have a it'll have um, uh, an increasing relevance in the region. Um, and then you have the, um, the newer organization, which is the Eurasian um, Economic Union. Um, now this includes many of the same countries in the CSTO. So this was really, it's often seen as, as, as Putin's attempt to recreate the Soviet Union light. Um, in fact, the original plan for this um, came from Kazakhstan. It came from the ex-president um, of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev. Um, who liked the idea of recreating um, a, a sort of common market, or a single market um, in, the old, in the old Soviet states, a customs union, basically. Um, and um, Putin was very keen to extend that from just being about um, economic um, 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 cooperation um, to a more sort of political um, cooperation. Um, but Kazakhstan pushed back against that because they're, you know, they're very worried about um, Russia's irredentist ambitions in their country. So Kazakhstan has a lot of similarities actually um, um, with, the, um, with the Ukraine um, because 20% um, of its population is, is ethnically Russian, um, rising to 40% um, along parts of the Russian border. And so they um, are very determined to maintain their independence. So they worry about that. So they want to work with Russia. It's very important, but they also want to be very careful about getting too close. Um, and so the, the Eurasian Economic Union um, came into being, I think it was in 2015, there or thereabouts. Um, and so it means that you now have a single customs union. Um, at the time, it was seen as being potentially 
um, a sort of competitor in the Central Asian space with the Belt and Road Initiative, One Belt, One Road, um, you know, that um, um, China's um, attempt to um, expand its sort of economic reach around the world, which really started um, in the Eurasian, in the Eurasian heart, um, heart, 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 heartland. Um, but um, Putin then decided that they could work together and that the two actually dovetailed rather rather nicely. So, you know, that sense of competition has kind of gone out of the window. So anyway, so you're talking about three different groups, one which is purely security military, one which is kind of a mixture of security and economics, and one which is purely e economic. OK. And does Putin want your, uh, your, your Ukraine to join the EU? Um, I mean, Putin would always like um, um, Ukraine to be um, um, to be a part of all of these things um, because you know Ukraine he sees as being part of the so-called Ruski Mur. I, I don't have the pronunciation um, in in Russian, but it means the Russian world. Um, and so, you know, Putin I think would always like to bring these countries in, um, but but you know it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that he necessarily do so. Um, you know, he, there are parts of Central Asia too which are not members. It's only Kazakhstan and um, and Kyrgyzstan, along with Belarus. Um, and you know, he would like you know Uzbekistan um, to be a part of that too, too, and, and Tajikistan. Um, but uh, you know, it's 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 all a question of of, of sort of putting these people in. And obviously, with Ukraine, um, in the you know, he's 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 doing it in a in a, in a much more aggressive way. Um, but um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. OK, now, obviously, your piece of a couple of weeks ago about the, the China and, and Russian access, we want to get on to in a bit of detail in a second. But be, be, before we get on to that, uh, can I just bring you back? Uh, and it, you, you, you may say not relevant, so that's a perfectly acceptable answer to this question. Uh, but you wrote a couple of pieces. One of them was called How to Lose the Eastern Front in May 2014. Now, maybe that's too far back, but when I reread those pieces, it looks as if there was uh, there was tension between China and Russia. OK, so it, 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 that may or may not be correct. But if it is correct, a lot has happened since then that has brought them to having an alliance. You can, if, if, if that question is worth taking, would you mind just filling in? Sure, sure. There's an awful, there's an awful lot to, to um, unpack here. Um, I th think in that piece, if I, looking back, um, when I was talking about the Eastern Front, I was talking really about Russian influence in, in Central Asia, so in those five um, republics that used to belong to the Soviet Union. Um, and in that piece, I was um, making the point um, that China ha was, and even by then, had taken over economically in that region. So, you know, this is this is a part of the world that had been entirely dependent, really, on its relations um, with um, with um, with Russia. So, all the pipelines, for example, the gas from Central Asia, all the pipelines led north into Russia. But China at that point was beginning to build pipelines heading heading east into China um, and was beginning to invest very, very heavily in the region. Um, and so economically, um, China had become top dog in the region, even as Russia remained um, the most important security presence. Um, that is even more the case um, eight, eight years on. So when I say Eastern Front, I was sort of saying that Russia had basically been the single power here. And now it was sharing power with the Chinese. I think that was the major point there. Now, um, on China-Russia relations, yes, I think 2014 um, really was the turning point. Now, I don't know how far back you want to go, but you know there is, there is, there are, there are hundreds of years um, of um, of of uh, mistrust between Russia um, and China. Now, um, we can. I, I think you know the best starting point, and please do tell me this is far too far back. <laughs> is if we can go back to 1689 <laughs> um, with the treaty. I think we have, of, we've, we've only got a few claims from then, but however. <laughs> <laughs> well, very very quickly. So back in 1689, um, you had something called the Treaty um, of um, of of um, Machinsk, and that was when Peter the Great um, and the um, and the Kansi em Emperor um, in the um, in the Qing Dynasty. Um, signed this treaty to settle the land border. So there'd been lots of problems even before then, you know, sort of where do you draw the land border between the expanding Russian empire and the expanding Qing empire, right? Um, and so they signed this, this sounds important treaty, but even so in the 19th century, Russia annexed outer Manchuria. So it grabbed a chunk of land the size of France and Germany 
combined. Okay, so this is this this sort of background um, that you, you've had this constant sort of fighting for the land between the two countries, and that is at the heart of this kind of historical mis mistrust. Now, in the 1950s, of course, the the Soviets um, and the communist Chinese um, signed a treaty of friendship and were very very close for about. A decade or so. Um, but then you had the Sino-Soviet split in 1962, it was when Mao fell out, um, fell out with the Russians because they were um, they were rowing back on their on their sort of Stalinist policies, which he dis disapproved of. And then they fought a border war in 1969. Okay, so, re so relations were, 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 were terrible. Now the border was then sealed and it only began to open um, in the in the 1980s. Um, most of the, the, the disputes were resolved in 1991, but actually it was, wasn't until uh, I think it was 2004 that all of those borders, border disputes um, had been um, had been resolved. Okay, but even then, you still have this kind of simmering sort of worry um, about about Chinese possibly coming over the border um, and a Chinese distrust of how Russia had treated them um, in the in the past. And until about 10 years ago, I'm also the big worry was that um, Russia would, would kind of lose some of that territory um, in the Russian Far East that it had originally taken from the Chinese back in the 19th century. Um, and a lot of this is, is, is uh, a lot of this is founded in the difference in population between the two sides. So the Russian Far East has a population of about six million um, and Manchuria or Donbei in Chinese, the three provinces um, that border Russia have a population of more than a hundred million. So you can see that there's a, there's a, there's a massive gap there. Um, and, and also, you know, this region of China um, had been the sort of heavy industrial heartland, but it was also um, where in the 1990s, when China started kind of closing factories and laying off state-owned mm -hmm. workers, you know, more than 30 million people lost their jobs and, uh, and, and many millions of them were actually in that region. And so it was, it was impoverished, it was having a hard time and the Russians feared that they would look, these, the, these um, unemployed Chinese would look over the border and see opportunities there and want, want to grab parts of Russia. So that is sort of at the, at the sort of heart um, of, the, of that distrust. But things have changed enormously in the last 15 years. Now, firstly, um, because China grew much faster than Russia, um, you know, very few Chinese looked to Russia um, or to the Russian Far East as an opportunity. Instead, they looked inland. And so no Chinese really wanted to go there anyway. OK. Um, and then I think, you know, the key turning point was really 2014, um, as you say, um, um, with Ukraine. So at that point, um, you know, the, the West began to slap sanctions um, on Russia. And so Russia had to look um, elsewhere. So it then pivoted east, it pivoted to, to um, China. And it was in 2014 um, that the Russians um, signed what is what is reportedly no one really knows exactly how much, but a 400 billion dollar contract to supply gas over 25 or 30 years to China via the what is known as the power of Siberia gas pipeline. OK, so this is the pipeline which only came on tap about three years ago and is now supplying more and more gas to China. And so I think that, I think trade is at the heart um, of this closer relationship. Firstly, it's about question, it was about settling the border dispute and getting that secure, and then it was about trade. And I think, I don't wanna go on for too long, and then I think you have a, a third factor um, driving this closer relationship, and that's geopolitics. Um, now, if you go back 20 years um, ago, you know, George Bush met um, Putin and claimed he looked into his eyes you know, and he saw a man that he could do business with, a man that he could trust. Um, now, of course, you know, the relationship between Russia and the US has kind of deteriorated, um, particularly over, over the last decade. Um, and, um, you know, it, it got significantly worse after 2014. And I think something similar has happened with um, China as well. And China always wanted to work sort of closely with the US, particularly when it came to trade um, and kind of economic matters. Um, but, but clearly since Trump came into power and then the US-China trade war started, um, you know, relations have also deteriorated there. Um, and so you have now, um, you know, this sort of mutual antagonism that Russia and China have um, for the US and they, um, and their mutual, um, um, sort of desire, I think, to kind of disrupt, if you like, um, and to kind of push back against the kind of international order that the US and its allies promote. Um, and, you know, at the moment, you also have Biden sort of pushing 
um, for a sort of a division of the world between democracies on, the, on one side and then um, autocracies on the other. I think that's sort of hardening um, this sort of this sort of emerging access between China um, and Russia. Um, and you know, for for sort of the last ten or fifteen years, you know, this has been happening slowly. Um, but um, it was often characterized as a sort of access of, um, of, um, of a convenience. Now, of course, there's still an element of convenience there, but I think we've seen a big shift in that relationship. Um, and now it goes beyond that. We, we, they are now political allies and they're presenting a common front. And I'll leave it there because I could go on forever <laughs> about this. No, no that, 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 that's what I think is important. So it, it has sort of changed. Now, just to bring in... Uh, from where I sit, it sort of strikes me as if um, Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Kazakhstan are linked um, in in some shape or form. Okay, now maybe it can all be linked under um, an us and them. And uh, if I'm talking to clients or about something and and I, I was talking specifically about uh, China and, 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 you know, why we like Chinese bonds. I go back to what I believe was a mistake, it's a personal opinion, where the US fined BNP for dealing with Iran. Um, and at that point, they weaponized the dollar. And I think that caused, you know, a lot of bother in China. I suspect it caused a lot of bother in, in Russia. And we have our ch chat now about maybe having a different payments system okay so um as i said I, I sort of see what happened in kazakhstan afghanistan moving pulling out okay, or the americans pulling out leaving a vacuum okay and i think um and we might come on to this a little bit to an extent we have a weaker leadership in the west um uh, and in many ways we have macron is the main voice we got a new german chancellor okay um, I'm not sure that Boris Johnson has a lot of credibility and Joe Biden appears to me to be quite weak with midterms. So there's a lot of opportunist, uh, opportunism, I think, going on. Um, yes, there is. I, 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 it's, I mean, there's certainly links between them. Um, and, you know, I mean, I suppose the, the common link between the three countries that you mentioned, Ukraine, Afghanistan and Kazakhstan, um, is Russia. And obviously Russia is influential um, in all three. Um, and yes, I think there is a link in the terms of sort of sort of us and them. But I think we've got to be a little bit careful um, about drawing, um, you know, these kind of discrete countries together. I mean, uh, you know, there are there are there are domestic issues at play in um, in each one. Um, and they're not linked. So, you know, if, if you look at Kazakhstan, for example, I mean, that was um, very much um, driven by domestic discontent. So, you know, the kind of spark for the uprising um, was basically a fuel protest that, you know, fuel prices for, um, for, for, the, for liquid petrol had, um, had been put up. And that's how most people um, um, fuel their cars um, in the country. But what was really behind it was, um, was kind of 30 years um, of um, authoritarian um, rule um, and sort of elite corruption um, and kind of inequality. So, you know, a few people doing very, very well, um, you know, and most people doing really rather badly um, under the system. Um, so I think that's quite different from what's been going on in, say, Afghanistan. So I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to kind of draw all these things together, but I, but, you know, but, but I'm a clearly, you know, Russia, um, is the link there. And one of the links is that Russia um, feels that it has, it either has or should have influence um, in all three um, of those um, of those countries. Um, and you know, clearly it feels that it should have the most influence um, in the Ukraine, um, because, you know, um, Ukraine is, uh, if you go back in history, you know, sort of almost, almost sort of Russia's roots are actually rooted in Ukraine, even, even more so than Russia, as I understand it. So it's very, very difficult for Russia to leave Ukraine alone. Um, Kazakhstan is slightly different because, you know, um, the Kazakh people um, are not, you know, um, they're not Slavs. You know, they are, they are, they are, they are different, but of course, you know, Russia has historically had a lot of has had a lot of influence there. And I, as I say, 20% of the country are actually ethnically Russian. 
Um, Afghanistan, you know, is a region, um, it's not quite what we'd call Central Asia today, even though it is one of the stands. But again, historically, Russia has always wanted to have influence there. Of course, you know, it, it invaded um, in the late 70s um, and was stuck there in the, in the 1980s. And now that the US has, um, has got out, you know, clearly um, Russia and China feel that they should have um, a sort of a, a security presence there. In fact, they need to because both sides are desperately worried about um, the potential impact um, of, um, of terrorism seeping out of Afghanistan and into their borders. So I think, you know, there are sort of a, a bunch of connections here, but I think we've got to be a little bit careful um, about, you know, saying that they're all, all about the same thing. Okay, okay. No, no, no. So some of your colleagues over the last, obviously been writing quite a bit about this, okay? Um, Anatol, for example, last week was 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 wondering who was the better chess player. Okay, was it the um, the West or was it the, the the Putin was the better? And this morning, uh, your colleague Tom Holland was arguing quite strongly that um, retaliatory sanctions by Russia would do substantially more damage to Europe than any Western than any Western sanctions would do to 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 um, to Russia. Now. It, it, and that there was a previous piece by, I think it was Louis, where it was sort of a, a bit of game theory going on, okay? And um, when you put those together, it, it appears as if Putin can win far more by not invading than rather invading. And allied to that, can you just update us where Nord Stream 2 is and how important that that is in his thinking about what's going on in Ukraine? Right. OK. I mean, I, 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 I'm not the Ukraine expert at all. You know, I don't know more than anyone else um, who reads the papers. But, I, you know, I sort of tried to try to um, answer some of those questions. Um, so I, I think what we were arguing today, um, I, I, I think it's a little it's not quite accurate um, to say that um, that Russia is in a much stronger position than Europe. I, I think what we're saying is that in the short term, um, Putin needs gas exports less than Europe needs gas imports. Um, and the reason for that being that, um, you know, I think Europe only has about six weeks um, of gas reserves. Um, and um, there are you know, LNG, um, uh, the LNG market at the moment is very, very tight. There's only so much that um, Europe can import um, to make up for a lack of gas exports if Putin um, turns off the tap. Um, at the same time, Putin has very large forex reserves at the moment, I think something like 650 billion US dollars. And so he can probably afford um, to, to cut off the taps for, you know, for a month or two. Um, he doesn't need his revenues immediately. So I think what we were arguing was that you know, right now Putin is in a stronger position. Um, but, you know, in terms of the sort of sort of the, the, the impact um, of sanctions um, on Europe over a slightly longer time frame, um, they probably wouldn't hit Europe that hard. Um, and um, that's because um, Europe, um, you know, only a, I think only three percent of um, exports from the, from the Eurozone go to Russia. And so, you know, if, if, if trade between the two countries ceased up, yes, it would be painful for some countries um, closer to Russia, particularly um, Lithuania, other Baltic countries and Finland. Um, but it wouldn't do much damage to the to the European economy um, itself when it came to um, to the trade impact. And then if you look at the finance impact um, on Europe, um, you know, exposure to um, to Russian residents, um, to Russian clients in the European banking system is also quite low. In fact, it's halved since 2014 as a result um, of sanctions and the deteriorating relations between the two countries. So um, I think banks are exposed to about $75 billion worth at the moment, which is only sort of 0.5% of, Euros of, of Eurozone GDP, to put that in context. Um, and so I think, you know, Europe, you know, it would be painful for some countries, but, you know, sanctions wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be desperate for Europe either. Um, but energy, is, is where it's is, is where the pain will come. Now, Nord Stream 2, as I understand it, as I say, I'm not an expert on Nord Stream 2. I mean, I've looked at gas pipelines. I can tell you a lot more about those between Russia and China and Central Asia and China. But as I understand it, Nord Stream 2 has been completed. So it really is just a question of when you turn um, on, the, on the tap. Now, I mean, 
Europe relies on Russia for, I think, 9%. So the EU relies on Russia for 9% of its primary energy needs. So for, on Russian gas for 9% of its primary energy needs. So, you know, it is very, very important. Um, and um, Germany is the biggest single importer. Um, and, you know, um, and as countries begin to transition um, towards sort of cleaner fuels, um, yes, gas is dirty, but it can be used as part of that tra transition as some countries use coal less and less. So, you know, there is still a demand for gas. And so, you know, you know that is still very, very important to those, to those economies. So, yes, it does give Russia considerable leverage. Um, I'm, you know, there's no doubt about that. Okay. Um, okay, did, um, w w if anybody would like any various questions, just please, uh, just to remind you, just tag them into the Q&A and uh, I will put them to Tom. Uh, Tom, go back to one thing in terms of the access. Um, I think it was one of the pieces I read that Xi and Putin have met 38 times in yeah. the six or seven years, uh, which seems like an astounding behind. Uh, time to be needed. What, what, what do you think? Um, what, there's a couple things. So, uh, I think there was virtually no coverage in the Western press, the English Times, Financial Times, or our local papers here, of that summit. Okay. Um, which is always kind of interesting mm -hmm. what you read and what you don't read. Um, so, they clearly have a close relationship. Any idea? Is it just they'll just continue to walk together? They see each other as two ridiculously stupid term, hard men, that's a really poor phrase, um, or, 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 or what do you think they want to achieve out of it? Yeah, so I mean, the first thing is, I mean, there, there does seem to be as much as we can tell, and it's always hard to know, you know, sort of, sort of how these leaders think and feel, but there does seem to be um, a, 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 a personal bond between Xi Jinping um, and Vladimir Putin. Um, as you say, they, you know, they've met 30, 38 times since um, Xi Jinping um, became president in 2013. And of those, I think 31 have been in person. So it includes um, online meetings over the last two years. Now, of course, you know, they met um, at the start of the Winter Olympics um, in Beijing the other day. Um, and that was the first in-person meeting either leader had had since the start of COVID. Um, both of them have been incredibly careful. Um, about keeping away from from anyone, you know, um, we saw the other day. I think was it was it Macron or was it another leader? You know, when they met Putin, they had to have five yes, five yes. COVID tests beforehand, right? So you know, he's you know he he is super super worried about this. Um, that as is um, as is Xi Jinping. He used to travel all the time um, before COVID. Um, so yes, you know, if you think about it, they are averaging four meetings a year, and supposedly, um, you know, their relationship. Um, was was a sort of an initially cemented and then lubricated um, when um, they were both uh, um, at the APEC, the Asia Pacific e Economic um, Forum in Bali in 2013, and Xi Jinping presented Putin with a, a bottle of vodka, um, you know, as a birthday present, and you know, and they had a few drinks together. Um, and you know, I, I believe in, um, Xi Jinping certainly in his youth was a was a big drinker. Um, I don't think he, he drinks too much now, but I'm, I imagine that Putin being, you know. The hard, hard man Putin, as you say, you know, they both like a drink and, and that helped to kind of, you know, to kind of form those bonds. And we all know that all our best friends we made when, when we were pissed, basically. So I don't think, you know, um, they may be leaders, um, but they're not very different. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that is a real thing. Um, but of course, um, you know, as I was saying before, you know, there are there are obvious, there are very good strategic reasons why Russia and China need to work more closely together. I think um, on the Russian side, they see, you know, they see this um, um, this antagonistic West, and they're looking for alternative allies, alternative friends, a strategic cushion, if you like. Um, and you know, China provides that. And so, in 2014, um, when when they thought, hey, you know, we, we may struggle to sell our gas to Europe, you know, because of sanctions. So, what we will have to do is sell it to the Chinese instead. Um, and now, what they're thinking is, you know, if if the West slaps um, sanctions on us again, um, you know, perhaps we can work with the Chinese to try to bypass some of those sanctions. So, you know, right now you have, um, you know, Russia is trying to work with the Chinese to create a sort of alternative financial payment system. Now, I don't think this is really going to work, 
because you know China's international payment system is, is still so small. Um, and you know when it comes to um, uh, not not using the dollar or the euro for for transactions between the two countries, you know uh, Russian businesses don't want don't want to use um, the um, the RMB because it's not fully convertible. So there are kind of problems there. But certainly the Russians are are trying to push um, to to work with China. Um, to try to blunt some of those um, financial sanctions coming from the West. So I say good strategic reasons um, on the Russian side. I mean, on the Chinese side, you know, I mean, China doesn't really have many or kind of almost any allies around the world. Okay, officially, it, it has it has a alliance with North Korea, but North Korea is more trouble than it's worth. It has a sort of de facto um, uh, sort of partnership stroke alliance with um, with um, with Pakistan but it's not really military um you know they just work very very closely together and that's partly that's all about really um keeping India on its toes um but you know if you're China it's 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 very difficult if you kind of look out around you you're surrounded by U.S. allies um and U.S. partners and so you know at, at some point um, you do want to have countries who you can work with and have friendly relationships with. Now, you know, what, what China's been doing over the last sort of 10 or 15 years is trying to build um, strategic partnerships, but, but really economic par- partnerships with countries around the world, um, not at this sort of alliance level, but, but kind of below that. And I, and I think, you know, when it comes to Russia, they're trying to sort of take that sort of economic relationship and, and make it into something more strategic um, because, you know, I, I think they see... Um, value in working with a country that can make life more difficult for China's own strategic rivals. So, for example, we come back to Ukraine. Okay, now China will um, never support a Russian invasion um, um, of um, of um, of um, of um, Ukraine because China um, is if there's one thing it cares about it's it's um, territorial um, um, integrity and the sovereignty and the and sovereignty of countries because it's obsessed with. Um, with what they call splitterism in Tibet, um, in Taiwan, um, um, and in Xinjiang, you know, and you know, China was a country that that was that was humiliated in the 19th century and in the 20th century by first the Europeans and then the Japanese coming in and nibbling off little bits um, um, of territory. Okay, so it's it's very very firm on this. So it'll never say, well, we support a Russian invasion um, 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 of, um, of, um, of um, Ukraine. What it will do, though, is it'll sort of go along with it. Um, it, it won't, it, you know, it's, um, it will provide some kind of diplomatic support around the edges. The reason for that being China is quite happy to see the US and its allies preoccupied in, in Europe rather than preoccupied or focusing back again um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, which is what Biden had said he wanted to do. So one of the reasons that the U.S. Um, got out of Af- Afghanistan was precisely because um, the U.S. strategists believe that they spent far too much time in the greater Middle East when actually the big strategic rival is China. So the idea was that now we can concentrate on China. So anything that prevents that happening is going to be welcomed in Beijing. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. With one question. Now, I think uh, with this question... Uh... Okay, this, um, I'll ask this question, it's probably not for you, Tom, and we'll, I'll probably answer it in an email afterwards, but uh, the, the question goes, uh, what are the arguments now for investing in China, bearing in mind anti-business actions by the Chinese government, together with our new relationship with Russia? Okay, it, 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 um, as I said, I'll probably answer that in more detail in an email back to whoever asked it, it's probably not necessarily uh, um, um, for Tom. Um, I, can, I can say some. I can say something briefly about kind of sort of um, risk, um, investment risk. You know, and, and, and I think you know the the China Russia relationship. Um, you know, it, it is sort of it it, it it sort of hardens the ongoing polarization of the world between the U.S. and its friends and everyone else, if you like. And of course, you know, the U.S. is has been it's trying very hard now to push back against China. China and to contain China. Um, and of course, you know, th- there is lots of talk about, um, you know, the, the potential for trying to um, prevent US investors um, um, from investing um, in Chinese markets. Now, you know, that hasn't happened, but it's certainly, um, I think, um, a, a fear out there. Equally, there is the fear 
um, that um, Chinese firms who are listed in New York and the US may possibly end up being delisted. Um, you know, as 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 basically the US draws up, you know, pulls pulls up the draw drawbridges, um, the other drawbridge, you know, um, against China, and you know, as, as and the closer that China works with Russia, and you know, the and the greater this polarization. If Russia did invade um, Ukraine, and if China did then provide some kind of support to help bypass sanctions, then you could see the pressure in Congress growing for um, a reaction and more sanctions against China as well as Russia. So, you know, I think there is some risk there. Do I see it happening anytime soon? Not really, because the China market is too important. And it's not just important um, as, a, as a sort of investment, um, as, as, a, as, as a market for, for US asset managers. Um, it's also a vital market, of course, for US multinationals selling to consumers um, in China. I mean, the last number I had in my head is that I think in 2019, um, sales by US firms in China were worth 600 billion US dollars. That's three times as much as US exports to China that year. But it's, you know, it's, it's a huge market. And, you know, and if, if, the, if the US slaps sanctions um, on, um, on, um, on US investors in China, China would likely retaliate with sanctions of its own against US business. Um, and that would be very, very painful. So I think there are lots of lots of risks out there, but I, I, I think um, you know that they're not imminent. Okay, okay. We have another more data. Let me just read this question, if I may. Uh, in the Western media, we are fed the line of Russian aggression in respect of Ukraine. Putin feeds the line of NATO slash, slash EU aggression in coming into the Russian sphere of influence. So, from an unbiased perspective, does Putin? Does Putin? Have a reasonable case, implying that the crisis can reasonably be defused by NATO stroke EU, acknowledging that Ukraine should not expect to ever be a full member of NATO and or the EU. Right. So look, one of us, as I say, I mean, I'm not a Ukraine guy. I'm not a Russianist. Okay. So I, I'm I'm coming at this in the same in the same way probably as all of your clients. Um, okay. Um, but I, I I do find this. I mean, this is a line that's trotted out all the time at the moment. Um, that actually, you know, it's it's just the West. I'll say the rattling. It's all about the US um, and the UK and other countries, you know, sort of sort of sort of trying to kind of, you know, sort of start up this drumbeat of war. Um, and, you know, it's totally unjustified. And really, Putin is not doing anything. You know, he's not going to invade at all. I, I, I just don't I just don't buy this. You know, it, it, it is a fact um, that Putin um, has has um, has amassed nearly 200,000 troops now, it seems anyway, between 160 and 200,000 troops on the border of Ukraine, right? That is a fact. Now you can say that it's just, you know, it's war games in Belarus or whatever it might be, but you know, I mean, any, you know, that is worrying for for, um, for any country. And also he has um, a history of doing this. I mean, you know, he did invade and take Crimea um, in 2014. You know, there was, you can argue over who was responsible for this, but you know, th th there was um, a, a skirmish or war of sorts. I mean, Georgia back in, back in 2008. You know, he does have a history of this. And it's also a fact that the West did try to get closer to Putin. You know, Russia was brought into the G8. Um, and, um, you know, it, it wasn't the West that, that went around um, sort of poisoning, um, um, you know, sort of former spies, um, you know, in, in, the, um, in, in sort of, you know, with, um, with kind of substances that could have killed hundreds of thousands of people as, as the Russians did um, in, um, in Salisbury in the UK, and, and it wasn't, you know, Western countries um, that shot down um, an aircraft, you know, the Malaysian Airways one. And so, I mean, Putin's behaviour, and it's not the West that spreads disinformation um, in Russia. So, you know, I, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm coming at, at this with a kind of Western bias, but I think the idea that this is all, you know, the fault of the West is utter nonsense. What I, what, what I do think um, is true is that the West probably made an error when they, when they talked about bringing um, countries like Ukraine and maybe the Baltic countries um, into NATO, right? So, you know, countries that border um, Russia, you know, this was clearly going to be very, very provocative. And that is what, you know, has caused a lot of stress um, in Russia. So I think that was a strategic error. But I, I, as I say, I, I just don't buy the idea that actually, you know, um, that, that Russia isn't to blame um, and we're the ones, you know, who, who are kind of trying to start a war here you know i think a war is 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 the last thing frankly um that um, um that western europe and, and and the us wants 
Okay, okay. All right, we'll, we'll wrap it up very shortly. Uh, some concluding remarks that um, if Ukraine sort of, you know, d does not a war in it, peters out, um, we are still likely to have this um, strong Asian-Russian alliance working together. Um, uh, and so, so your concluding thoughts, if you don't mind, Tom, in terms of how you uh, crystal ball ga ga gazing, okay, and I accept you're not the, 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 the Ukrainian expert, but clearly in the whole sphere of the Belt and Road initiatives, the other agencies that we spoke about, um, give us your sort of views, informed views, this is how you see sort of the geopolitical situation playing out over the next, say, five years, for argument's sake? Um, well, over the next five years... Um, well, yes, in other words, it, it passed this, this, this uh, uh, slightly, this immediate Ukrainian yeah. crisis on the assumption that I'm assuming that that actually passes in the next numbers of, of yeah. weeks. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, over the next five years, I mean, I, I think you will continue to see Russia and China getting closer to closer to one another. You know, um, you know this is something you know they've made a, a decision here. I mean, if you read the statement that came out after the last meeting, you know, it's it's very very long. <laughs> you know, and that, and that kind of tells you anything. You know, sort of sort of sort of that something really is going on here. And I think I think it's quite likely. Um, that um, China and Russia will announce in the next year or so that they will build a second massive pipeline, gas pipeline, Paris-Siberia 2, um, which will run from the same source, the same oil field that actually will supply Nord Stream 2 as well. Um, so you think that Nord Stream 2 will um, have a capacity of 55 billion cubic metres of gas a year. Paris-Siberia 2 um, would have a capacity of 50 billion cubic meters. So, so basically the same. What that will mean um, in theory um, is that um, Russia will then be able to choose or be able to play off um, European consumers against Chinese consumers, right? Um, so that gives it gives Russia more kind of leverage um, um, in Europe. Um, and so, yeah, so, so that's an obvious strategic play um, for, for Putin. So obviously they are very, very keen on this pipeline. And I think that China will be keen as well, because Chinese gas demand is going to um, sort of double um, over the next sort of 10 or 15 years. So, so currently, I'm trying to remember the numbers, I think last year they imported something around 300 billion cubic metres of gas. Don't quote me on, on that. But, it, but by 2035, CNPC reckons it'll be 610 billion cubic metres. So China, you know, China's en energy uh, demands is rising very, very fast. And because it's transitioning away from coal, um, gas is seen as a bridge fuel. So China needs more gas. And it would much rather get it through gas pipelines than through LNG, um, which is much as secure. And it means buying it from countries like Australia, um, where it has very difficult relations with other them anyway. Um, and it also means that um, you know, um, China may, may also open a new gas pipeline from Turkmenistan as well. Um, and you know, the, the more options it has, has for, for, for buying it, the stronger its negotiating hand is on price. And so I think there are all sorts of reasons why, why China and Russia will, you know, um, will, will kind of remain closer together. Now, what will happen um, with Ukraine and Europe and Nord Stream 2, I don't know. But I, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's in Germany's best interests, you know, forgetting the, the strategic aspect of this, you know, it's in Germany's best interests to get hold of that gas. You know? <laughs> it, it, it needs the gas. Clearly, Russia will want to sell it the gas. So once all of this sort of you know, um, once all this all this arm wrestling is over, I suspect Nord Stream Two will go online. Um, the US will hate it, but you know, I mean, they've built the thing. You know, they spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on building it. You know, I'd be surprised then if it doesn't go ahead. But sort of looking beyond five years, um, you know, I, I think Russia will uh, eventually just become less relevant. Um, you know, it, what's amazing is that such a puny economy you know, um, has such strategic relevance, it seems, in the global economy today. You know, sort of Russia's economy is smaller than Italy's, it's smaller than South Korea's. It's not even a, a top 10 economy um, anymore. Um, its demographics are awful, you know, sort of Russian, Russians die at ludicrously young ages. 
Um, and, you know, compared to China, you know, China's economy is already 10 times bigger than Russia's. And, you know, that partnership will, you know, it, it may strengthen, but China's, um, you know, it's very lopsided. Um, and, you know, Russia will become an ever more junior partner um, in, that, um, in that relationship. So, um, you know, I, I think sort of in time for um, sort of economic reasons and dem demographic reasons, you know, Russia will become a less relevant player. Um, and militarily too, it will remain strong, but China will be will be much much stronger. Um, and um, you know, it, 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 depending on, on where the energy price prices go, you know, Russia may even find um, you know if even when energy prices fall again, that it has much less money to spend um, on maintaining its military and its military power. You know, if it can't keep up, you know, Russia too will will have less relevance. So. You know, I think Putin is playing his cards now. I'm just not so sure whether Russia will have as many cards to, to play in 10 or 15 years' time. Okay, very good. Okay, well, Tom, with that, let me uh, thank you. I am, on my behalf, on behalf of um, all of our listeners, we got uh, tremendous numbers, as always. And um, just to uh, remind everybody, this is the second edition out of uh, China's Asia's Dream. And... Um, uh, I found, Tom, when I was reading it, um, you, you almost have to take a map out, okay? You get your Google map out and you... Yeah, you do. And you sort of see, it took 15 hours to get from here to here, and now there's a road, or I know it's four hours. So it, it, it it's a fantastic book, um, but you don't need me to say that because there's lots of great uh, praise at the back of it. But if anybody gets it, I would recommend using it with Google Maps because it's uh, it's, it's fascinating like that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, these days I'm, I'm, I'm branching out though. So, uh, so um, that book was about um, Asia. Um, but, you know, um, I, um, actually, my last trip before COVID was I went to, I went to Africa, to, to Kenya, I um, went to um, Ethiopia, looking at what China, China's doing in that part of the world. I'm off to Mexico on Friday, my first post, post COVID trip. And I'm looking at Latin America this year. I'm going down to Brazil in June. So I'm, I'm, I'm now, you know, it's very much the case that, you know, that China's expanding tentacles are growing. They're growing longer and thicker um, around the world. So, you know, that's so uh, you know, it's, it's not just Asia anymore. It's, it's now China's global dream, if you like. Yes. yes. OK. Yes. OK. Well, with that, uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, pleasure to see you. And um, thank you for that little explanation earlier on about that great painting in the background. Uh, I think you should keep it. You can tell your colleagues uh, you get the vote to keep it from here. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for taking the time to tune in uh, this Monday afternoon. Uh, there will be a recording on the website later on this evening. And as I said to Tom earlier, we will have a, a Philip Brown sketch of the webinar as well out uh, probably early next week. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.